Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the only ultra-rapid-acting inhaled insulin. By Dexcom, keeping you in control with an integrated system for diabetes management. And by Athletic Greens. AG1 has been part of millions of mornings since 2010. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, how are those New Year's resolutions going? By this time in January, it is possible you've given up. But it's also possible you just set your goals a little too high. Hey, let me put some wiggle room in there. I'm going to train three days per week. Maybe to start out, I'm only going to go once. And that's okay. But I put that on my calendar. I know I'm going to go. You know, I'm going to pre bolus at lunch. I'm going to, you know, change my infusion set when the little alarm thing goes off when my pump tells me to. Awesome. That's a huge win right there. And then just continue building on it slowly instead of saying, I'm doing all of it immediately and then you don't do any of it and that makes nobody win. That's registered dietitian and certified diabetes care and education specialist, Ben Zeal, who also lives with type one. We're gonna talk about how to make the changes you want in a way that helps you stick with it. And he's gonna share some of his experience in a trial where he ate, no joke, about 4,000 calories at one meal. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. And before we jump into my conversation with Ben, a huge thanks for last week. A really great response to the Dexcom episode with Kevin Sayer. I mean, we always have a great response when we have Dexcom on, but this one, there was something a little different about this. We had a great conversation on social media, in the Facebook group, and on the main Diabetes Connections page about CGMs for health, not just for diabetes. And the episode itself was heard by so many people. So thank you if you shared it. I know there's so much interest in the technology and as we wait for the G7 to launch here in the States. Um, But I I do appreciate you always spreading the word that is the best way to let people know about a podcast like this. So do you make New Year's resolutions? I do love the idea of a fresh start every year, but I struggle with making the actual resolutions. I, I think it's for me, it's more of a take stock situation. Like, what do I want from this year? Right. What am I hoping for? I stopped making resolutions because I could never keep them. And that's where this week's guest is a huge help. Ben Seal is the founder of Your Diabetes Insider. He's a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist, a certified strength and conditioning specialist as well. And we're going to talk about what kind of stuff really works. You know, it doesn't matter if you adopt a new habit, if it doesn't last. And we're going to talk specifically about improving habits and mindset around diabetes. We also sort of accidentally start talking about the time Ben ate 4,000 calories at one sitting. It was in a clinical trial, but it wasn't a trial about like extreme eating. So he'll explain more about that. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afreza. How many times have you miscalculated timing of a mealtime insulin dose? It happens a lot. You know, you dose after you order. Uh, the restaurant gets busy, your meal takes longer than expected, or you just forget to bolus or you bolus too late. This happens to Benny quite a bit. And then he has to deal with the high blood sugars. So it might be time to think about Afreza inhaled insulin. Afreza uses a breath-powered inhaler to quickly deliver insulin powder into the lungs and bloodstream. It is fast in, fast out. In fact, with Afreza, insulin is released into the bloodstream in less than one minute and may start to lower blood sugar in about 12 minutes. Ask your doctor if Afreza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afreza logo. Afreza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and it's not for patients with chronic lung disease, such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you ever smoked, ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afreza. Afreza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afreza.com slash safety. Ben, thank you for joining me again, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Stacey. I'm so excited for this year. That's great to hear. I love starting it off right. I purposefully didn't want to talk to you the very first week of January. And as you listen, you'll note, we didn't do like a New Year, New You kind of show because I 
get sucked into that a little bit every year, but I didn't want to contribute to it because I'm laughing because I don't think it works. So Ben, talk to me about how you, you know, somebody in your position who helps people and specifically around food and blood sugars, how do you look at the beginning of the year? Well, I feel like a lot of people look at it as some sort of rebirth when at the end of the day, it's really just whatever day you decide to make a change. It could be August 17th. It could be, (laughs) you know, April 12th. It could be January 1st. It doesn't really matter. But with the slate wiped clean metaphorically, I feel like a lot of people are thinking, I want to attack this massive, massive goal. I want, you know, that 6.2 A1C. I want to drop 30 pounds. And they try to bite off more than they can chew right away. And they look at the final destination, but they don't look at how they're going to get there. And then they end up falling short within two or three weeks and then feeling frustrated. And then at the end of the next year, wondering why they didn't achieve it. So there's a lot of things. I've, I, there's so many directions we could go right now already. So I guess my question would be then, it's this massive, massive goal at the beginning of the year. And again, I've done this myself every year. But if we, <laughs> if we set this, if we're set up to think about this as a massive goal, where do you recommend we actually start? You know, how do you start small? Well, and and I feel like that's the best thing to think about is how do you start small? You take Mm. the massive target, right? Let's just pretend your A1C right now is 8.2 and you want to get under seven, which can seem super daunting, especially if you've never been there before. You now know where you want to go, but most people think, okay, cool, I'm going to get there. And they don't actually set aside concrete action items that they can start doing. And the reality is thinking of it as, okay, this is the goal in six months. Now, what am I going to do every step of the way? What are going to be those hurdles? Maybe you're thinking, okay, let's get to eight or an average glucose that would be approximately eight, right? Then to seven and a half, then to 7.2, then to seven, and then of course under seven. So by breaking it down into those little pieces and then saying, okay, to get from 8.2 to eight, what do I need to change? Starting there ends up laying such a strong foundation that can then be built upon. And every day you're stacking a brick on top of the brick from the day before. And eventually you've built the skyscraper and you've gotten to that target. But most people just look at where they need to get to and they get concerned and just assume it's going to happen and they don't prepare. And when you don't prepare, you don't get what you want to get. I just worry, you know, so much goes into that. I mean, I don't live with diabetes, right? So I don't Mm. really know. But I look at my son, I look at my friends and it's just so many things to keep in mind. Is there one change that most of your clients start out by making? I would say the first thing would be, and and I I joke with people about this, but I feel like the food side of things, 80% of blood sugars, 80% of weight loss or strength gain, 80% of performance, which people don't really think about from a sports perspective, is directly tied to your food intake and your nutrition intake. And so I feel like just getting aware of what you're consuming, even if that's doing something as seemingly tedious, which I promise it's not, but seemingly tedious as tracking your food for two, three, four days and getting an idea of what that looks like and looking at the blood sugars alongside of it, that is enough to be able to start to see, okay, this is where I run into trouble. And then from there, you can start to make adjustments. But if you don't even know you know, what you're starting with or what your baseline is, you don't know where to even begin. And that's where people get overwhelmed. They think I could do 20 different things, but I don't know which one to do. So I'm just going to do none of them. You know, it's funny when you talk about tracking food, I've done that, you know, for different diets and things that I've been on in the past. And I always find that as soon as I start tracking my food, I immediately, at least for a week, I eat completely differently because I want to, I don't want (laughs) to lie to my app or my journal, right? But I don't want to write down like, 10 Oreos, 8 p.m. or things like that, right? Do you find right. that your clients do that? I mean, how do you get people to be honest? Well, and I tell people, I say out of the gate, you know, we're not here to judge you, right? All of us are dietitians on my team. All of us live with diabetes ourselves. We all have exercise backgrounds. We're all people that have done all of these things. We've all had the eight or 10 Oreos in one sitting before. So I tell them, you know, just eat how you normally eat. Let's just picture it as, you know, it's, like, it's an assignment for school. You're just writing down what you happen to eat mm-hmm. that day. Keep it as normal as possible. We're not going to judge you. If you have a piece of birthday cake because you want a piece of birthday cake, awesome. But at least then we know this is where you're starting at. And the only way to really make progress is to be true to what you're doing at the beginning, right? So if you say, hey, I'm being honest with myself, then you can make changes from there. If you say, oh, well, I only ate three pieces of celery and four almonds, but you're full of it, then that's not going to help you. And you're really just cheating yourself (laughs) at that point, you know? And you're going to be hungry. Well, that, that too, my God, don't even start me down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, we, we've all been there. We've all done it. Like I've sat there and I've destroyed 
you know, Nutella before and I've destroyed, you know, different desserts. And I posted a video the other day about, you know, cheesecake and an Oreo cheesecake. And it was phenomenal. Right. Like I'm, I'm all about eating awesome food, but if it's part of your daily life, you know, include that in there, but be honest when you're looking for something for blood sugar changes or weight loss or whatever it is, if you're honing in on the food, that's where I tell people to usually start. I know people pay you for this kind of stuff. So I'm not going to ask you to give away all of your secrets, but you mentioned food, trying to get a handle on what people eat. So what do you do with that information? Then you mentioned, you know, get trying to get somebody's A1C down and food is the best place. I assume you don't just from the comments you've made, you don't immediately then say, okay, we're going super low carb or you can't, you wrote this down. So now you can't eat that. But you know, all kidding aside, where do you go with, once you get somebody's food journal or diary, what do you do with that? That is a great question. Cause a lot of people wonder like, okay, cool. I have all this food data. Now what do I do? And or what am I supposed to do with this? And the reality is we're not people that are going to say we're going to overhaul your entire life. Like you tell us, oh, I had this for breakfast. And we're like, great, you're never eating that again. Our goal is, yeah. you know, little teeny steps. So it might be, hey, you're having fill in the blank at breakfast. Now let's maybe push that a little bit later in the day based on what your numbers are doing. Or maybe, you know, hey, this doesn't seem like it's going to be sufficient at lunch. So let's add something with, I don't know, I'm making this up right. Right. protein or let's add something, you know, add a couple of veggies or a fiber source or something to it to make the meal more complete. So we're taking these little baby steps and making adjustments and also keeping in the back of our minds, you know, what are the blood sugars doing with it? Is there always something that we're seeing that we need to tweak as well? And from there, if you know what to look for and you know how to say, hey, let's make these little changes. We kind of line everything up that we want to do. We have the whole game plan laid out and we start with just a couple little things and we slowly build on it from there. So suddenly you look back and you're like, wow, two months ago, I was eating completely different, but it doesn't feel like I've changed really radically because I've done it so slowly. When I think about the advice in terms of dosing that we've gotten for many over the years, you know, our endocrinologist always laughs with us. He's such a great guy. And he's like, okay, as per usual, you should try to pre-bolus and, you know, and maybe, you know, Make sure you're correctly dosing because my son, like a lot of people, estimates a lot. Oh, yeah. Are those the two top things that your clients need to change or is there something else? Is there like a secret that I, I'm missing here? The secret. Absolutely. There's no there's no crazy secret because I feel like it's so person dependent, right? Like yeah. someone might pre bolus perfectly, but they can't get enough food before a workout to save their lives. But then somebody else <laughs> might be perfect with, you know, before a workout, but they've never even heard of a pre bolus before. It's all very person dependent. I would say insulin timing is a massive thing. And then the other big thing that people don't talk about as much as they need to is the concept of how fat and protein can impact your blood sugar as much as carbs do. No one talks about it. And then when the occasional time that someone says, oh yeah, you know, my, my dietitian at my office or the diabetes educator or the endo told me about this, they usually give them information that's not 100% accurate. So then they're trying to do something with, you know, the wrong directions and then it doesn't work and they get frustrated and people feel like they can't have certain food because they don't know what to do for fat and protein. Can you give us a little bit? Again, I know <laughs> these are, these are yeah, things people yeah, pay no, you to do. Of course. Like just a little, a little sneak preview on like why fat and protein are so important. Yeah. Or maybe even had a dose for it. I was going to say that the biggest thing is with fat and protein is, is fat slows down your digestion, right? So you eat, let's say that Oreo cheesecake I just talked about a few minutes ago. So you have that Oreo cheesecake. Of course, there's going to be fat in there. There's going to be carbs. There might be a little bit of protein if we're lucky, but you also assume you don't just eat that by itself. You probably ate something before and there's going to be protein from that. And the thing with the fat is it's not going to allow the blood sugar rise to happen. You'll get the initial rise from the carbs, right? And then later on, you're getting this rise. It might be three hours later. It might be four hours later. I think my personal record is eight and a half hours later. And it just comes in like an oncoming train and your blood sugar just starts to rise and rise and rise. And that's how a lot of times people will go to bed and their blood sugar is 122. They're feeling great. And they wake up at four in the morning, having to use the bathroom and they're 317 because mm -hmm. this fat will kick in and they forget that it's going to be there. And half the time they're not even aware. So now they're thinking, well, could it be, you know, dawn phenomenon? Could it be, you know, hormones? Could it be something else? And the reality is, it's just that there may have been a high fat meal previously. So typically, and, and you know, this would be going into the weeds. And I, I tell people all the time when they're like, how do you do this? I'm like, it really depends on the person. There's an overall framework that we're able to, to guide people with. But the biggest thing is what we affectionately call the, you know, the now and later dosing technique, right? Where you're dosing now, 
for what you need a dose for, for the carbs, like you would for anything else, but then realizing that there's going to have to be another dose later. Cause there are studies that have been shown with people on the, the loop systems or completely auto, like autonomous systems that show that during a high fat, high carb meal, I think on average, it was 47% more insulin was needed total for the same thing. So it was 50 carbs in both situations. They compared, I think it was 50 carbs and 50 grams of fat versus 50 carbs, 10 grams of fat for the 50 fat and 50 carbs. They needed 50% almost more insulin. Some people needed double the amount of insulin just to maintain their blood sugars. Nobody talks about that. Yeah, that's wild. And it's the kind of thing where you, you kind of could see experimenting on your own, but that's a lot. And I will say like with what we try to pride ourselves in is most people say, Hey, I don't know how to do this. What do we do? And we're able to get people to at least, you know, circumvent about 85 to 90% of the trial and error. So instead of thinking, great, you know, I know what I'm looking out for. I'm going to go to, I don't know, Culver's or some sort of fast food place and try this out. I don't even know if there are Culver's all over the country. I just, I think of it from my Wisconsin <laughs> roots, right? But fill you know, fill in the blank of your yeah, own, fill, fill uh, your own fast food place. Exactly. Like I could go for some Zaxby's right now. So we'll just say Zaxby's, right? You go to Zaxby's, let's go get all this. And instead of having to try it 10 or 15 times to nail it down, our goal is to say, hey, you know, within two, three, four times, you now have this. And now you can not only apply it to, you know, Zaxby's or Culver's or whatever place, but you can also apply it to pretty much anything else, whether you make it yourself or you don't. That's the biggest thing. But it's something that nobody talks about, but needs to get talked about so much more often. How are the automated systems? helping people that you see, you know, control IQ, Omnipod 5, the Medtronic systems, have those made a big difference? It's made a huge difference for us over the last couple of years, but I'm curious what you've seen in terms of helping people tweak them. I think it's a love hate. It's really a love hate. (laughs) There's so much good. There's so much good for getting rid of some of the variability with something like control IQ, doing the automatic doses. So if your blood sugar is 250 and you're sleeping, it'll help bring it down, you know, slowly but surely with the basal or if you keep it off, you know, with the boluses too. But I think there's also still room for it to improve where a lot of people, at least that I see, the rebound off of a low is just abysmal every Mm. single time where because the thing will turn off, it'll be off for an hour and then someone will correct and, but you know, they'll take their, their low snack, but ends up being too much because the insulin that was off now kicks in later. And suddenly they went from 70 to 170 and we don't want that either. So I feel like that's, you know, one potential limitation. Some people have the, for control IQ, it has to be a five hour insulin on board time. And for a lot of people, their normal insulin on board time is three hours, three and a half hours, maybe four. So five can seem like a really long time. So just another little factor that can play a role, but I think for what it is, I think there's so much good that's coming from it and the direction that it's going. It just needs a little more finessing for it to be able to be this actual autonomous system. I feel like there's still a lot of manual, you know, manipulation that's involved, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. We found that as well. I mean, Benny really likes to let it ride and it does a good job, but you could see if he interacted with it just a little bit more. Um, oh. And that's kind of what we're, what he's hoping for. What I'm hoping for is that the next iteration of these systems will require a lot less user participation. Let's just put it that way. Right back to Ben talking about that. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And if you're a veteran, the Dexcom G6 is now available at Veteran Affairs VA pharmacies in the United States. Qualified veterans with type 1 and with type 2 diabetes may be covered. Picking your Dexcom supplies up at the pharmacy may save you a lot of time, too. Connect with your doctor for more information. Dexcom even has a discussion guide you can bring with you. Get that guide and find out more about eligibility at Dexcom.com slash veterans. Now, back to Ben talking about his experience with the artificial pancreas trials. And this is where we get into the conversation about that enormous meal. What is it now? The Islet, I think, is the name of the, the new one coming yes. out from Boston University. I was in one of the early trials for that, and that basically required zero intervention on my part. It was very little. This was almost, wow, almost eight years ago at this point, but it required such little user necessity. It just did its own thing. And it, the most I had to do was put in, you know, was this normal meal larger than normal or smaller than normal meal? And it would do the rest. And if you didn't do that, it would still figure it out. But you know, this was also way back earlier iteration, but that's the type of thing where I feel like 
there's a lot of potential right around the corner. It just feels like we just keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And I'm just, <laughs> you know, I see control IQ and I see the five and I'm like, there's for Omnipod and there's so many good things coming. But I'm like, can we just get to the next level so it can just be even better and, you know, make everyone's life even simpler? Yeah. So. And just to jump in on that, as you mentioned, yeah. the studies at Boston University. So the company, as you listened, the company is Beta Bionics. The islet is in front of the FDA, as Ben and I are speaking. It has not been approved, but it was submitted with you basically just put in your body weight and then you tell it when you are eating, but you do not put in the carbs. Yeah. You just say, I'm eating a regular meal for me or I'm eating a larger meal than usual or a smaller meal and you don't put the carbs in. It's been a long time in development, Ben, but hopefully we'll see that approved this oh, year. Fingers God. crossed. Well, I was going to say the fact that I just had to think about the math and I'm thinking, wow, that really was eight years ago. Is just yeah. mind blowing to me. But what I will say is back then I, I ate 10,000 calories in a single sitting on that thing and my blood sugar did great. So if that's any indication. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> Do you remember what you ate? You ate 10,000 oh, calories? I don't know if I remember every single piece of what I ate. Is but that we, a, wait, wait, was that in a day? That was at one meal. That was at dinner. Um, <laughs> so I mean, so this is, you know, this is the nutrition nerd in me, right? I'm in, I'm in the middle of grad school. I'm doing all, you know, type one stuff. And I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to really test this device and see how well it works. And so you're familiar with with Maggiano's, right? The restaurant? Yes. So all of their entrees, by definition, are going to be 1,500, 2,000 calories as is. And they have this family style thing where you can sit down and I think you, the maximum reservation you could have, I think, was, I don't know, 15 people. So I invited like my 14 closest friends and we all just went there and got the family style where they just keep bringing out plates of food until you're done with that course. Then they box up the rest and give it to you. So oh I, I had some obscene amount of food and I ended up doing the actual, you know, food logging of it because I wanted to know for the sake of research. Right. And it ended up coming out to about 10,000 calories. I will say in my defense, I did prepare for about three days to eat that. And then the day after, because, you know, the glycogen was so full and I had so much food in me, I was able to go out and have a crazy workout. So I used it to my advantage. But at the same time, <laughs> The device, I, the highest I got was 3.30. I never peaked wow. past 3.30. I ended up, I think I had like four desserts plus all the pasta, plus all the, you know, chicken, plus everything else. And it was amazing. Like that was, I have to say, it was probably one of the top diabetes memories I have just because it gives so much hope to what could be here so soon. But obviously- And you, yeah. to be clear, Ben, when yes. you say you tapped out around 3.30, again, you just said, I'm eating a big meal. You didn't put carbs or corrections Nothing. In. And th again, th yeah, this was the older version. This still had, you know, it was two pumps and another, like a Dexcom was in there and an iPhone was right. attached. Like this is before all of the stuff that they have now. But yes, to your point, say, I believe is a very similar algorithm. I, I wouldn't be the one to ask on that though. But I mean, it was, I'm eating a larger meal than normal. Didn't do anything else. Let it take care of itself. I love it. That's so, amazing. And, what and a dream. Not or a nightmare, depending on who's listening. 10, well, saying, don't, not advocating by any stretch to eat 10,000 calories in a single sitting. I wait, did wait, it. Carbs are, carbs are calories. Oh, this was, this was calories total. There were probably, I don't remember how many carbs. I did the math. It was probably well north of 400 carbs in one okay, sitting. Okay. That's what I was thinking. When you said 10,000 yeah. carbs, I was, you said calories, but I think I heard carbs. So my yeah. brain like fritzed out. Not, okay. not advocating for that by any means. And like I said, I prepped for a few days ahead of time I did certain you know types of workouts I did everything on purpose and intentionally but at the same time you know it can be done it's fun when you are able to enjoy food and understand like in that case you know the fat and protein effects I don't know how I know I took a ton of insulin that day that didn't tell me on the actual device because I wasn't allowed to see that as a participant but right. it was probably I don't know it was probably 100 plus units in one sitting but again that's that's, it's the automation of the device so all I'm saying from that is lots of good hope around the corner but Fat is definitely a huge part of the diabetes and blood sugar equation. So pay attention to that as well. I'm not sure how to segue out of that, but we're going to oh, try. You're, <laughs> you're totally fine. <laughs> we're having fun here. It's all good. Yeah, no doubt. As we're talking here, you know, at the beginning of the year, just a couple of weeks in, this is the time when honestly, a lot of people have already kind of given up on a New Year's resolution. And you mentioned earlier, they have this huge goal, you know, and it's sometimes unattainable or very difficult to do. Any advice? For somebody who's listening who said, okay, January 1st, I'm eating this way and I'm always going to pre-bolus and I'm going to change my infusion set on the dot every three days. And here they are a couple weeks later and it hasn't worked out. How do you keep trying? Well, and, and you just mentioned there, I think it's a great point. You just said, you know, pre-bolus change at a certain point for my infusion sets. There was another one you said too, you know, for mm -hmm. all of those, right? 
I would say just pick one of them. Just tell yourself, hey, I'm only going to focus on pre-bolusing and maybe even I'm going to focus on pre-bolusing my lunch right now. And I'm just going to focus on doing that for a few days until that becomes second nature. Then, okay, now let's add dinner. Okay, now let's add breakfast. Suddenly, you're pre-bolusing everywhere. You don't feel overwhelmed. And every time that you stack on one of those wins, I don't know if you get, you know, one of those uh, dopamine little bursts or whatever. But with respect to that, you start thinking about, wow, you know, I was successful with that. That's awesome. Now I can build off of that. And you can have the whole checklist and that whole roadmap that I mentioned earlier, where you have the changing my infusion set, pre-bolusing every meal. You know, let's say maybe you're adding on exercise because you want to get that going for this year too. So, you know, going to the, to the gym or going to do a workout three days per week, you can start chipping away and have everything there. Some people do a vision board. Some people just put it on, you know, a checklist. You can start chipping away at little pieces. And as long as you're making headway on, on all of the little pieces in little tiny, tiny chunks, you're winning. I think people just want to take on so much and they say, I'm not going to eat any carbs. I'm only going to pre bolus you know, at this point, at this uh, time. And, you know, I'm always going to do this. And I'm always, always and nevers never seem to go well. And I know that I just used a never in that sentence, but, you know, <laughs> absolutes are typically not going to work because they're too restrictive. If you're able to say, hey, let me put some wiggle room in there. I'm going to train three days per week. Maybe to start out, I'm only going to go once and that's okay. But I put that on my calendar. I know I'm going to go. You know, I'm going to pre bolus at lunch. I'm going to, you know, change my infusion set when the little alarm thing goes off when my pump tells me to. Awesome. That's a huge win right there. And then just continue building on it slowly instead of saying, I'm doing all of it immediately. And then you don't do any of it. And that makes nobody win. Yeah. I mean, I'm listening as a mom of a kid with type one. I always make my own New Year's resolutions and they get harder and harder. And some years I don't do them at all because I've been discouraged in the past. I love that. I'm thinking as I'm applying it to myself, I always think way too big. So I've got to find something really small. Maybe for two weeks, it's, you know, more vegetables at lunch or something like that. But instead of saying like, I'm going to lose 50 pounds this year, you know, I'm going to change my diet. I love that way of thinking. But it's hard because I think maybe as human beings or maybe it's societal, but we're kind of programmed to take these big swings. Do you find that some of your clients give you pushback? Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And people are like, wait, I want to do more now. And I say, you know, trust in the process. I've seen this happen time and time and time again where they want to swing for the fence, which is great. It's like, you know, it's it's like you're down 10 nothing in a baseball game. You can't swing the bat once and tie the game. Like you have to chip away at it. It's the same concept, you know, same thing. Hey, let's start with, you know, getting one run across the plate, then another one, then another. Oh, look, now it's 10 to 10. It's the same thing here. You know, hey, I want to lose 50 pounds. Well, to lose 50 pounds, first you have to lose one. Then you have to lose two. Then you have to lose three. And then so many people think, oh, well, it's been a month. I'm only down four pounds. I quit you're doing awesome. You're down four pounds, like celebrate each step of that, you know, journey. And the other thing I'll tell people is when they want to quit and not necessarily people I'll work with, but maybe sometimes I'll say to them, you know, Hey, just don't quit for one more day. You know, just keep going, you know, keep going to to that, you know, workout just one more day and say, Oh, I'll quit tomorrow. That's fine. And sometimes with that, the people never end up quitting. They end up saying, Hey, I'm going to log my food for one more day. I'm going to, you know, pre bolus for one more day. And suddenly they look up and it's been four months since they last missed a pre bolus, and they're thinking, wow, this is amazing. But I really think that breaking it into small little pieces and then telling yourself, you know, hey, j- if you're about to quit, just one more day, one more time, that tends to go really, 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 really far. And celebrating each like step, I think, can't go understated as well. Because otherwise, you just keep moving the goalposts and you're never happy. So you were, you were diagnosed as a kid and you've been doing this, as you already alluded to, you know, when you were in graduate school, you were already interested. This was what you were going for. How has your diabetes management changed, if you don't mind sharing, oh. over the last couple of years, 10 years, however much you want to share? Oh, wow. That's a great question, too, because I feel like the technology changes have certainly helped. But looking mm. back, I think 2023 is going to be, this year is going to be 10 years of being on a sensor as well. So I guess that's kind of monumental. So if we look at just the past 10 years, right? Before that, things were a little different. You don't have a CGM. CGMs weren't really a widespread thing. It's going to be a little bit different. But I think since, you know, getting that and the technology advances, I've started to care a lot more. And it's not just because, oh, I want to go into diabetes. I want to make diabetes a career. But I also just started realizing, you know, hey, I feel so much better when my numbers are on point but I also still don't want to be limited. So there's, you know, a time where people don't care. You know, you're in your teens, you're in your early twenties. Oh, I can do whatever. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to eat whatever. I'm going to, you know, live my life and do all sorts of crazy stuff. 
And then you start realizing, hey, I want to feel good more often. Like I don't like sitting at 260 for hours on end. And I think that started to hit while I was in grad school. And that's when I started playing with, you know, different types of diets and different ways of training and seeing what really worked well for me. But there was a period of time, probably up into grad school a little bit, that I just, I was kind of, it was kind of there. Diabetes was there. I wasn't horribly controlled. I wasn't great controlled. My A1C usually hung out at like 7-1, but it just wasn't, you know, it was just kind of there. I didn't really pay as much attention as I could have. And I probably had a lot more swings and spikes than I would care to admit just because the, I didn't care enough. And then I don't think I looked at the long-term picture enough. And that looking back, do I regret it? I mean, sure, but I can't really change that now. I can just change going forward. So it, it, everyone has their own time of their life where they say, Hey, I'm ready to, you know, actually take this seriously. And mine just happened to be when I was, you know, 24, 25. Hmm. Right about when that brain development really kicks in. <laughs> I didn't think about it like that. <laughs> that's a really good point. Yeah. That's actually... Uh, that just blew my mind. So thank you. For yeah. That. Well, as a parent, we are often told, wait till they're 25 or 26. Like then everything really falls into place. We hear that number a lot. I don't know how true it is, but it's pretty funny. Now that you bring it up, it's, it feels very true. And it's kind of scary, honestly. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, holy smokes. Wow. I You're thinking about what you did before that. <laughs> well, I'm just thinking of like two. I never put two and two together until right this second, but it's so valid at the same time. And I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks that. I know a lot of people that when they come to us to, you know, to work with my team and I, they tend to be, you know, 26, 29, 32, you know, it doesn't tend to be often the younger people. And when it is, they're like the ones who are highly, 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 highly dialed in and motivated who probably maturationally are closer to 25. All right. Before I let you go, give us the pitch. What have you got on tap? We we missed the January 1st New Year's special, but I'm sure you've got nah. stuff going on. <laughs> no, I was going to say there's well, like we talked about, you know, January 1st, everyone's setting their resolutions that they hopefully are still sticking with. And if not, they can set new ones because remember, you don't have to set a New Year's resolution. You can set an right. April 16th resolution. It really doesn't matter. I would say for us right now, we are our practice is open. We're accepting new patients, which is awesome. We all are dietitians who all live with type one. We have one that specializes in type two. If you happen to, you know, have, have type two and you're listening, we do also accept a bunch of the major insurance carriers now. So that's awesome. So if that's something you're interested in, obviously let me know, but we're here to help you with achieving amazing blood sugars, eating incredible food and becoming stronger than you ever have been before. So if that is up your alley, definitely reach out and let's see how we can help you. You know, it's funny. I talked to you a couple of years ago, Ben, and you really, you know, you were really excited about this. You you really seem to enjoy what you're doing, especially when I look at your Instagram posts. You're having a lot of fun. <laughs> Are you still having fun? I like to th- say, yeah, I like to say it's, you know, it's evolving. And my goal is still, I want to reach a million people living with diabetes and <laughs> show them that diabetes does not have to be that thing that restricts your life. And you can live freely. You can live an incredibly full, awesome, and, you know, delicious life in terms of food, right? So why not make it happen? And what better time than now? Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Stacey. I I always love chatting with you. And I'm just honored and blessed to be able to come back. Next time you can invite me out for a 10,000 calorie dinner. Hey, (laughs) don't tempt me with a good time. That's crazy. (laughs) You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information from Ben, how you can work with him, find out more from his team, just go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the episode, or you can go into the podcast player you're listening to, depending on which one it is. Uh, The show notes may be a little difficult to read or click through, but they're always there and you can always come back to the homepage if you need to. A lot of people don't make New Year's resolutions anymore, as I mentioned, I don't, but many do choose a word of the year. And I do that. I've done that for the last couple of years. For a long time, I thought it was like a little too kind of out there, a little woo-woo, which is not really my thing. But I will tell you what my word of the year is and why in just a minute. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Athletic Greens. I gave AG1 by Athletic Greens a try because I was looking to kind of get more vitamins into my body. I wanted that daily nutrition you know, I'm reading about all this long-term gut health and how important that is. And my doctor was talking to me about probiotics. So with just one scoop of AG1, I get what I'm looking for. I started trying it just kind of mixed in water, which is one of the ways they tell you it can, can, and it's fine that way, right? But then I threw it in a smoothie. Oh my goodness. Now you have to be careful what flavor. 
The chocolate, I got to say, mm, vanilla, fantastic. This was really out of the ballpark. I gave Benny a sip too, and it does turn the whole thing green. So he kind of like looked at it and blah, but he said it was delicious. And I agree with him. <laughs> that was just a, you know, a typical vanilla powdered smoothie. I use oat milk to make my smoothies these days. I'm going to try EG1 um, a bunch of different ways, and I will be sharing that with you through the weeks to come. So if you want to take ownership of your health, today is a good time to start. Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Stacy. That's athleticgreens.com slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. We've also got their logo on the website. You can just click on the EG1. That's at diabetes-connections.com. I started a word of the year probably back in 2018 or 2019, and I really like doing this. Uh, I find it just helps me focus on the year ahead, and it doesn't always work out. My word for 2020 was opportunity, and, you know, (laughs) we all know how that went. But my word for this year is embrace, and 2023 is an extremely busy year full of milestones. My husband and I will have been married for 25 years. My daughter is graduating from college. My son is graduating from high school. We are having a very large family reunion for my husband's side of the family, something we have never done before. And we're hosting it here. Yes, please say a prayer. That's in May. And we are also taking part in a quasi-family reunion. A a bunch of people that don't normally get together are going to do so for Thanksgiving on my mom's side of the family. So I chose Embrace because I want to, (laughs) some of you will laugh at this, I want to embrace that, yes, I am getting old enough to have a college graduate and high school graduate and be married for this long. (laughs) I really want to embrace all of these milestones and, you know, be positive about them, cherish them, be grateful for them. And I want to also embrace the changes that are going to be coming because of them. And I want to do some literal embracing. There's going to be a lot of hugs this year. It just kind of came to me and I think it really works. I shared this on social, but I don't think I had shared it on the show. By the way, that brings up a good point. Please join the Facebook group, Diabetes Connections, the group if you're on Facebook, or at the very least, make sure you're on our email list. I know not everybody is on social media and it's probably smarter not to be these days. But if you're on the email list, that's how we get the word out. It's not just about surveys. It's about letting you know which companies we're talking to. And then you can pass along your questions. That is one of my favorite things to do. And I got to be honest with you, I think the people that we talk to at Dexcom and Upcoming, Tandem, Imbecta, all these companies that are on my list for the next couple of weeks, they like to hear from you all. They really appreciate getting questions from you because, frankly, they run focus groups, but the CEOs in particular often only hear from, you know, other corporate folks. So love to do that. Uh, Just please make sure you're on the email list or one of our social media groups. Quick note, no newscast this week, but we will be back next Tuesday with John Wilcox from Dietech trying to solve the issue of pump occlusions by looking at them in a new way. This was really interesting. So that's next Tuesday. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.